Okay, today we're going to look at inverse trig functions. Now, up to this point, you have a lot of familiarity with the primary trig functions, the sine graph, the cos graph, and the tan graph. For example, with the sine graph, we know that the input is the angle, which is plotted on the x-axis, and the y-value is the ratio plotted on the y-axis. So if I put an angle in, pi over 6, <clears throat> which is 30 degrees, the sine ratio of 30 degrees, pi over 6, would be 1 half. And any angle I pick, the angles plotted on the x-axis, any angle has one ratio. So 30 degrees, which is right here, um, its ratio is 1 half. No problem. One input, one output. One angle in, one uh, ratio out. And that is true of the sine, the cos, and the tan. And also their reciprocal functions, secant, cosecant, and cotangent. Okay, now we want to look at the inverse trig function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the inverse of this expression, which is to switch x and y, and to get y isolated, I can write my expression as y equals inverse sine x, and in some books you'll see inverse sine written as arc sine x. So that just means inverse. So the input is now the ratio, the output is now the angle. So if I do the inverse sine of a ratio of a half. Now on your calculator, you have done this in the past many times in your study of basic trigonometry. Uh, you will simply type in inverse uh, 0.5 and the calculator will tell you that that is pi over 6, which is represented again right at the spot. The problem though is, you'll notice from the graph, is that there are many angles that have a ratio of a half. If I extend my sine graph, and I've just got part of it drawn here, there are many angles which have a sine ratio or a ratio of one half. The calculator, though, is only giving us the one angle. It's giving us the angle at pi over six. And you might wonder why is it doing that? Well, it's doing it because it's treating the inverse graph as a function. Now, because the original sine graph here is not one to one, its inverse is therefore not going to be a function. A given ratio has many angles associated with it. And as we've discussed before, in order to make our function one to one, what we need to do is restrict the domain. So what the calculator does is it thinks about only a certain part of this entire sine graph. And for sines, specifically from here, up to here, from pi over 2 negative to pi over 2 positive. This is what we call the principal sine graph, just this little part. Because if we take just that part, the part where it's increasing, then the inverse of it will be a function. So if you think about it, all of your basic trig functions, sine, cos, and tan, all of them are not one-to-one. -one. None of them are one-to-one. -one. So what we need to do to make them one-to-one -one is we need to restrict their domains. And the way we do that we'll talk about in just one minute. Now just one other issue to discuss before moving on. That's just in terms of notation. We know that sine squared, written like that, means sine of the angle all squared. Okay, That's standard notation. However, this notation, which represents the inverse, is not the same as this notation which represents the reciprocal. Alright, let's just talk about what the restricted domains are for each of the six trigonometric functions. Now in your course package you have six graphs that show you how these restrictions are done. So when you look at these graphs, there looks like there's a lot to know here, but let me just help simplify this all for you. So um, I have a sine graph that I talked about um, a little bit earlier, and I have it restricted. The standard way to restrict the domain so that its function is so that the function is one to one is to go from negative pi over two to pi over two. That is the restricted domain. Okay, so the graph will go from here up to here. Okay, and the range is still from negative one to one. Now what's going on over here on the right is simply that I have taken the inverse of this graph, x equals sine y, which can be written as y equals inverse sine x. I've reflected the graph across y equals x. Okay, 
Now the scaling is somewhat different and I've created this graph. So the domain and the range of the two graphs are switched. All right, what's really important here is just this. If you remember what the restriction is for the basic graph, then if I were to ask you to draw the inverse graph, it would just be a matter of switching the x and y as you do with any graph, reflecting across y equals x, and you'd have your inverse graph. So this is the important part, remembering what the restriction is for each of the six trig functions. Okay, for tangent, uh, the graph um, has this shape that goes on endlessly, but because we want the function to be one-to-one, -one, we are only going to take that interval. So those are the allowable intervals for the angles for restricted tan. Range is all real numbers. For secant, it's as shown. Cosine is from zero to pi. Okay, so your angles are between zero and pi. That's the part of the graph we look at in terms of uh, making it one-to-one. -one. Cotangent is restricted zero to pi as well. And cosecant is restricted negative pi over two to pi over two, not including zero. So again, the important thing to remember here are the restrictions on the angles for each of the trig functions. All right, let's talk about some identities related to the inverse trig functions. Now, if I take a value and I inverse sign it, remember when I inverse a ratio, because this is a ratio, this would represent an angle, and then signing the angle would give me a ratio back again. Intuitively, I would expect that since I'm doing the inverse operation to a given function, that I should get x back again, and I will as long as x is in a certain range. Now, because the x here represents a ratio, I just need to ask myself, what are the allowable ratios or the possible ratios for sine? Well, between negative one and one. So if I take any value of x in that range and I inverse sign that and then sign it, I should get back what I started with. Okay, the second example, similar situation, except that this time, x here represents an angle. How do I know that? Because the sine of x is a ratio, and then the inverse sine of a ratio is back to an angle. And so if I inverse sine sine, I should get back what I started with, but since x represents an angle, I have to ask myself, what is the allowable restriction for sine? So I go back to my graphs from a couple of pages ago. I remind myself that the angles are only allowed to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And so that is my restriction on this identity. All right, inverse cosecant of x x represents a ratio because the inverse of something represents an angle. All right, if I draw a picture of this, another way to state this is to say that the cosecant of an angle is x. Now if the cosecant is x, that means that the sine of the angle is 1 over x, which means that theta would be inverse sine of 1 over x. In other words, these two expressions are equal, therefore inverse cosecant of x is equivalent to the inverse sine of 1 over x. You can think of this as saying that if the ratios are reciprocals, then the angles, which are these expressions, are the same. Similarly with secant. Secant is related reciprocally to cosine, so the inverse cosine of 1 over x is equivalent to secant of x. The ratios are reciprocals and so the angles are the same. Inverse cotangent is equivalent to inverse tangent of the reciprocal ratio.
and the allowable ratios for tangents and cotangents would be all real numbers. So this is true if x is all real number except because of this x cannot be zero.